if it's going to work. All right. Verse 2, we should serve the Lord with gladness. Positively, this means, as we see in Psalm 37 and verse 4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. See, it's a two-way street. We devote ourselves to the Lord. We delight ourselves in serving Him, and He will bless us. I delight to do Thy will, O my God. Yea, Thy, thy law is written in my heart. Psalm 40 and verse 8. Looking at this negatively, no one should have to be forced to serve God. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 47. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Context says because they didn't worship God with gladness and joy that they would be cursed. We're to be joyous when we come into the presence of God. Psalm 122 and verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our worship services are to be spiritual. And it also needs to be joyous. Our singing should be the result of our joy. If anyone's happy, let him sing. It should be pleasant to God and to us. We need to sing praises to God. Songs of thanksgiving to God. And it ought to encourage each and every one of us and make us feel good in the process. Our songs ought to be scriptural. Wayne brought that up this morning in Bible class. When we study the Bible, that should bring us joy. Psalm chapter 1 and verse 2, the blessed man. It starts out looking at the blessed man from a negative standpoint. He doesn't do some things. But in verse 2, it contrasts. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. His delight is in the law of the Lord. So when we worship, when we serve, when we, when we live for God, it ought to be a joyous thing for us and not some burden that we do because we think we have to. And that's the, that's the two-edged sword of a command from God. There is a sense in which a command must be done. We don't have a choice. We're commanded to do something. But it shouldn't be a burden to us to obey because we're doing it out of joy and delight in our service to God. We ought to want to do those things, not do them because we have to. Verse 3, God made us. Now this could be looked at in one of two ways. It could be looked at from the standpoint of the Israelite nation. That God made them what they are. He built them up. They didn't get there by this. God made us. We didn't make ourselves. It could be that. But I think more likely this is going back to the creation of all mankind. God made us. We didn't make ourselves. We didn't create ourselves. We didn't get here by accident. Some, some accident of evolution. We didn't get here that way. God made us. And if, if, if God made us, he made us with a purpose. He put thought into it. We've already seen that from the foundation of the world, he had a plan for the church. We've seen that from the foundation of the world, he had a plan for man's salvation. It's not like we do sometimes get up in the morning and say, well, what am I going to do today? Oh, well, I'll just do this, just at the spur of the moment, Right? No, it's not the way God works. God had a plan. He put thought into it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, verse 27, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth 
and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God had a purpose. We see that purpose spelled out for us in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Psalm 1 and verse 3, all things were made by him and without any him was nothing made. Romans 9 verse 20 and 21. Nay, but O man, who art thou that Replies against God. So the thing formed, say to he that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay or the same lump to make one vessel of honor and another unto dishonor? Psalm 139 basically says, God, you really made me, thus you really know me. We don't belong to ourselves. We're his people. Galatians 2 and verse 20, Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me in the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Glorify God in your spirit and in your body, which are God's. We're the sheep of his pasture. Jesus Christ is our shepherd, the good shepherd. Hebrews 13 and verse 20, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of everlasting covenant. John chapter 10, verses one through 10, Jesus is, is described as the good shepherd. And we are his sheep, we need his guidance. Isaiah 53 and verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 1 Peter 2 and verse 25, for ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. We have a lot for which to be thankful. Verse 4, wherever we enter to worship, we should be thankful and we ought to bless his name. Ephesians 5 and verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God, the Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Colossians 3 and verse 15, let the peace of God Rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 18. In everything give thanks for this is his will in Christ Jesus concerning you. Verse 5. We need to remember that God is good. God is good. Matthew 19 and verse 17, he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. God is the perfect example of goodness. We see his love, which brings about mercy and grace. And all we have to do is look at Calvary. Look at the cross. And we can see the goodness of God demonstrated God didn't just talk a good game he demonstrated his love you know we're e it's easy for us to say a lot of things right but saying it is one thing doing it is altogether another there's too many people that say without doing but say without doing. Don't be that person. His mercy is everlasting. What a thought. What, what a concept. Can we, can we even wrap our, our feeble minds around that? 
His mercy is everlasting. Ephesians 2 and verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us. Notice the motivation behind mercy. When we sin, when Adam and Eve sin, the very first sin in the garden, God said the wages of sin is death. By their disobedience, they earned their sentence for what they had done. But God loved them. He loved them enough to have thought before He even created them. To have a plan ready to go in a moment's notice in the event that they sinned. And when they sinned, that plan went into action. And it was motivated by God's love for mankind. You ever wonder, you ever ask yourself why God created us? I believe God created Adam and Eve as an expression of his love. God is a social being. There's three persons in the Godhead. And God, according to 1 John, is the personification of love. God is love, John says. Isn't it natural that that love be expressed in creation? Yeah, here's God's creation that came forth out of his love. And they sin. And they stand condemned, worthy of death. The death that he imposed as punishment for disobedience. But he loved them. The great love wherewith he loved us. Do you, you, do you like how, I know I do, do you like how when we read about God's attributes, it's always abundance. We see words like abundance or great or exceeding. That's the nature of God himself. His attributes are infinite and out of his infinite love, he demonstrated infinite mercy. And out of that mercy came the plan. The grace whereby God was going to sacrifice his dearest possession to save sinful man. We just sang about it. We just sang those songs about the things that God has done for us and is doing for us. Ephesians 2 and verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of His grace. See that exceeding riches of His grace. He didn't have just enough grace to get by on. He had abundance of grace. More than enough. That He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I wasn't there when Jesus was alive. I didn't get to meet him and talk to him and follow him while he was on the earth. I wasn't there to see the nails driven into his hands and his feet. I wasn't present when they pierced his side with the sword. I wasn't there when he gave up the ghost crying out, it is finished. But I still can see in that moment in time the exceeding riches of His grace. And that's going to stand as a testimony to God's grace, His love, His mercy for every generation who will pick up the Bible and read it. His truth. And this is why that's true, that we can pick up the Bible and read it today, because His truth endures to all generations. Is there ever going to be a time when there are no Bibles left on the earth? Never. You know how I know that? Because God's promised. 
help providentially care for that. They've been trying to wipe out the Bible and keep it out of our hands for decades. They're doing it now. Our government right now is an enemy of Christianity. Some of our government say that, that Christianity is the greatest existential threat against our nation. Among everything else, Christianity is the greatest threat to our nation. Trying to stamp out Christianity, trying to get rid of God's word, it's not going to happen. God is greater than they are. Heaven and earth, Jesus said, shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's how I know. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. That's how I know that there will never be a time on this earth when the Bible is not available. 1 Peter 1 and verse 25. The word of God, the word of the Lord endures forever, he says. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. It's no wonder that we should praise His name and give thanks to Him in our worship, in our daily lives. Let us make a joyful noise to the Lord. Let us praise Him and give thanksgiving to Him. Demonstrate it in our lives that we love God the way He loved us. That's what we need to do. But you can't do that if you're outside the body of Christ. If you haven't taken advantage of His love and mercy and grace that He's bestowed upon us through the sacrifice of His Son, you have to study the Bible to learn about Jesus and, and develop faith in Him. And based on that faith, do what He says. Repent of your sins. Confess His name before men and be baptized for mission of sin. And as Christians, we need to continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. Worshiping and serving Him all the days of our life. And if we go back into sin, we need to remember that His grace and mercy and His love still is there. We can reach back out to the Lord in humble repentance and ask for His forgiveness as Christians and He'll forgive us. And we can be re returned to faithful service to our Lord where we too can make a joyful noise. So tonight, if you're subject to the invitation, whether you need to be baptized for mission or sin, need to be restored, we invite you to come forward while we stand in.